I'm joined today by John Lott and Evan DeFilippis. John Lott is president of the Crime Prevention Research Center and author of the book More Guns, Less Crime, Understanding Crime and Gun Control Laws. Evan DeFilippis is the co-founder of Armed with Reason, and we are indeed here today to talk about Mr. Lott's book and the claims made in it, the research within it, More Guns, Less Crime. Uh, John, it's really a pleasure to have you here. As our audience may know, oftentimes when we hear studies cited that argue that more guns correlate with less crime, it is indeed your research that is cited. So tell us a little bit about that, starting first with this broader claim that more guns correlate with less crime. Right. Well, first of all, just as a clarifying comment, it's just not my research. About 70 percent of the peer-reviewed studies by economists and criminologists find a benefit in terms of reduced crime from people being able to carry concealed handguns. Uh, you have about 30 percent who claim that there's no effect uh, on crime rates. Uh, no one in any national study by either economists or criminologists has found any bad effects in terms of murder, rape, or aggravated assaults. Uh, now, you know, the argument is pretty simple. You know, just like higher arrest rates or higher conviction rates can make it more costly, more risky for criminals to go and commit crime. The fact that a victim might be able to defend themselves can also deter criminals from committing crimes. And we see this in many different ways. You see not only a drop in uh, violent crimes after concealed carry laws get passed, but more importantly, the states that issue the most permits have the biggest drops. And over time, as more permits are issued, you see further drops in violent crime rates. You also see important differences across different types of crimes. So, for example, crimes which involve direct contact between the victim and the criminal, like violent crime, fall relative to crimes where there's not a direct contact. You see bigger drops in mass public shootings than you see in murders generally, and there's a simple reason for that, and that is that's consistent with this argument, and that is you see greater deterrence as the percent as the probability that someone can defend themselves increases. And if you attack people in a public place, the probability at least someone's going to be able to defend themselves is much higher. And you also see, among other results, you see geographical differences. So if you look at counties on either side of state borders, the states that uh, adopt right to carry laws see drops in their border counties. At the same time, the counties right across the border, touching these other counties that don't have these laws, saw slight increases. All I mean, right, right, so now, that, that's, I, a, that's a lot there. So let me let me allow Evan to jump in. Evan, you've analyzed the research done by John Lott significantly. What is your take on what he's telling us? Yeah, so if you'll give me a time to correct some of the some of the things John Lott just mentioned, when when he's saying, to be clear, when he's saying that the vast majority of studies support his claim, what he's actually referring to is a paper that he wrote where he's compiling uh, sort of a review of the literature. He unsurprisingly excludes something like seven studies that just completely disagree with his thesis. Um, and the list of studies that he does include are also shockingly weak. For example, one of uh, the studies that he includes, the author um, revoked um, his own conclusion. Uh, in another, the author just simply misinterprets and misreports his own results. So this idea that there's a, a consensus in the literature is, is just completely misguided. Um, second, I think that the best way to examine this more guns, less crime discussion is to just ask some common sense questions about the content of the results coming from either side. Uh, do the results make sense? Do they cohere with what we know about empirical reality? And back in 2004, the National Research Council convened, and there was a pan it consisted of a panel of top 16 academics in the United States. They attempted to determine the validity of more guns, less crime. And using Dr. Lott's own data, following his methodology to a T, 15 of the 16 members concluded that Dr. Lott's assertions were not supported by the evidence. There's been other research that has designed to test the accuracy of Dr. Lott's so. models. And, um, and they determined that it, it contains a host of bizarre results. For example, if you follow Dr. Lott's regressions, in a huge chunk of counties, there's negative arrest rates. 
which doesn't even make sense. It would require, for example, police officers going into prisons and unarresting people. You, they ha he, his model suggests that increasing the unemployment rate would decrease crime, even though we know that that can't be the case from criminological data. It, it suggests something like um, you know, black elderly females are strongly associated with a crime rate, even though they're neither victims nor perpetrators of crime. So you have all of these very bizarre results which should make you be skeptical of the quality of uh, of his statistical models. And then at the same time it lacks predictive capacity as well. There's a study done by Dr. John Donahue at a Stanford University and using Dr. Lott's precisely the same models, precisely the same data, but just extending it out for a, for a little bit longer period of time with data that Dr. Lott didn't have, uh, he found that there is no trace of a positive effect of concealed carry laws on crime, and there was a substantial increase in aggravated assaults. So essentially, we have a situation where more guns means more people attacking each other, and this is using John Lott's own data and his own models, but just a slightly longer time frame. So it lacks predictive capacity. That his models, you know, they're, they're it's riddled with bizarre and inconsistent results, and uh, it it's there is not the type of consensus that he's suggesting. Dr. Lott, feel free to respond directly because there were there were some very specific claims there made about what you said. Yeah, well, it's, you know, it's um, pretty amazing. But look, you take the National Research Council. People can look it up. It's online from uh, 2005. Basically, what they said is they couldn't draw any conclusions, not that they rejected my work. And the thing is, if you read the National Research Council report, they couldn't come to any conclusions on anything. There's not one gun control law that the panel was able to come into a conclusion about. If Evan can point to something that they actually came to a conclusion on, because they examined about 20 different types of gun control laws, I'd be very interested in listening to one that they were able to come into agreement on, because they weren't. Uh, what James Q. Wilson, who's considered was on the panel and considered uh, kind of for many years the top criminologists in the United States point out is if you actually look at their results, even though they weren't able to come to a conclusion, this was a committee that was put together under the Clinton administration, by the way. People there were subject, were selected under the Clinton administration. What he pointed out is that all their murder rate results actually showed drops in violent crime. Now, you know, with regard, you know, you want to keep on focusing on just me. It's just not myself who's done surveys of this. Carl Moody at William and Mary has done a survey, has come to essentially the same types of results. The issue is, do you go and you look at national data, or do you go and you pick some small area of a state or a city? Even those results don't find any particular result. Uh, but if you look at national data, rather than cherry-picking things, I mean, one of the reasons why we try to look at all the data that's available rather than picking one state or one city or 34 counties or whatever you want to pick with these different things is that if I can pick different data, like I could flip a coin 20 times and if 10 became heads and 10 became tails, if I let you go and pick five coin flips that you could pick on your own there, then you could get any result you want. You could pick five heads and say this is an unfair coin. Well, Obviously, I, I understand the case. analogy. I guess the disagreement I see the two of you having is that on the one hand, Evan said that in a sense, you, uh, 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 Mr. Lott, cherry pick data by excluding studies that did not support the claim you were making, whereas you're saying that the cherry picking is happening by the other side. Uh, so so it's well, saying Evan, the way he misinterpreted uh, the National Research Council report deliberately I mean, just completely misreported it. But beyond that, what I'm saying is, is that <clears throat> I don't cherry pick. What I said was I, I have a rule. The rule was essentially national studies that were done on, on crime rates. But even if you look where to include these regional ones, essentially all these regional ones in terms of statistically significant results really weren't able to show anything. And so whether you want to have the Gary Kleck one that you point to or others, Gary says that there's no effect. Others that you can point to say there's no effect. So you say, okay, rather than 30% of the studies saying that there's no effect, maybe you can get it up to like 38% or something like that. Okay. But that still means 62% of the studies, even if you want to include these ones that just pick little tiny areas within the country and running their results solely on those rather than looking at 
all the data that's available for all the years that it's available, you still find the vast majority find a benefit and no real evidence of any bad effects from these laws. All right, Evan, and we'll, we'll go back to you on this and then we'll move on to the next question. Yeah, so, so he makes some interesting points. Uh, uh, Lot is essentially correct that the result of the NRC was that no conclusion can be made. My point is that... On anything. My point is that Dr. Lott is the one that's making the rather ambitious claim that more guns equals less crime. And then he retreats to this position that no conclusion can be made as a result of 15 of the most qualified academics analyzing his model and data. This, this extraordinary claim that of the causal relationship between guns and crime requires extraordinary evidence. And John Lott's model simply lacks the capacity to figure out what the true relationship between that is. There's this line. You don't understand the way the National Research Council reports look. If you look at them, almost all of them don't find anything. On but anything. let's 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 allow Evan to speak no, though, because I think he's moving aside from the NRC report. No, if no, that's what he was he trying to do. You don't even understand how the NRC reports are put together. They force people okay. to Dr. come to unanimity. And the only thing. Okay, but Doctor Lot, let's please okay. allow Evan just to finish because I, he didn't interrupt you. Let me let's hear what he says. Yeah. Um. Okay, so, uh, so again, my point is that they were agnostic about the question of more guns, less crime. Essentially, there was not enough statistical evidence to support the claims that John Lott is making. And then this notion of consensus, I could go in a line by line of the studies that he cites. And, for example, one of the, one of the studies he cites is this, is this Moody and, and Marvel, along with a couple of his colleagues, uh, this is a study that John Lott cites in his own work to support his contention. If you look at Table 3 of this study, and, and we'll put this up on our website after the discussion, the study clearly shows that after the passage of concealed carry laws, there is an increase in aggravated assaults on both a state and a county level. Moody and Marvel simply just don't bold the fact that it's significant. This is either a massive oversight or there is some intentionality to it. No, um, don't understand what's going on there. I, well, I can I can show. I can it. explain it to you if you'd like me to. I I, I would appreciate that, but I, I mean I've talked with other experts on the subject, and they think it's just a little bit suspicious that this using your precisely your own data, uh, they find that there's an increase in aggravated assaults after the passage of concealed carry laws, and they simply just don't mention it, um, in the conclusion. Um, the other some of the other research that he cites is um. I mean, there's this, there's this one study done by Plasman and Whiteley, and Whiteley. correspondence between one of the co-authors has the, has the author simply saying that the results don't make sense anymore, and he's abandoning, uh, abandoning the content of the argument. And he cites this as evidence to support this notion that there's a majority. At the same time, he considers this one dissent uh, by John Q. Wilson as equal James. to the 15 others that make the argument that there is no relationship or that there isn't enough significant evidence to show that there is a relationship. So there's just this very strategic cherry picking of data to create the notion that there's a consensus and the argument falls upon almost at the moment of inspection. There simply is no consensus. And anyone that's interested in doing research can find that there's plenty of studies that contradict these claims. Let's pause there. I'll remind the audience that we're speaking with John Lott and Evan DeFilippis, we're going to take a break and continue our conversation. We are still speaking with John Lott and Evan DeFilippis. The Let me go back to Dr. Lott on, on this point and see if we can, we're going to have to at some point agree to disagree, but Dr. Lott, let me allow you to respond directly to, to two specific claims. One, that some of the studies you cite do specifically show a correlation between more guns and more aggravated assault. You said you wanted to explain that. And number two, the claim that Evan made that some of the studies you cite have had uh, have since been uh, kind of retracted by the authors. Okay. Well, first of all, the study, I mean, I'm happy to address the other assault issue too, but the point he was making was with regard to the Carl Moody and uh, Marvel paper. And, and the point that's there is they're looking at essentially Ayers and Donahue's, the other author's uh, model, and they're fitting a straight line to what's curved data. When you look at things on a year-to-year -year basis, there's no increase that suddenly occurs right after concealed carry laws are passed. It's simply an artifact of fitting a straight line to data that's curved. So the line lies above the curve to begin with, lies below it in the middle, and lies above it again at the end. 
And what they point out is that fitting that straight line artificially gives, makes it look like there's a temporary increase, but there's really no increase that occurs there. That's the point that they were making. Now, as opposed, as a, so far as our author is backing away from the studies, the one that I've seen you mentioning is by uh, Michael Maltz, who ended up w doing work with uh, David Olson, uh, who's at the University of Chicago, at Illinois, you know, University of Illinois at Chicago. And uh, what happened in that case is that Olson still agrees with it. Maltz later did another paper where he says that county-level data, you can't use that for looking at crime rates. Well, their paper was on state-level data. So I don't even see what the point is. Can you explain to me what the point is of saying, looking at saying that county-level data is not reliable? But in any case, my work looked at city-level data, which they didn't say that there was a problem with, county-level data and state-level data. And, that, and essentially, you get the same results across all those different types of things. Now, with regard to the issue of aggravated assaults, there's one paper that's been published out of all the four dozen or so papers that have been published now on this issue that claims to find a small temporary increase in aggravated assaults. Uh, but, you know, again, it's this issue of faith putting a straight line to data that's not straight. And so you can get these things where it temporarily goes above this line or not, even though the general pattern is downward going down. And so that explains basically that point there, too. Sure. It, it just sounds like you're no longer making th this argument that th the definitive and ambitious claim that more guns oh. lead to less crime when you're citing studies in which the, there's disagreements in the authors, uh, you know, there's problems statistically, there's okay. complex conclusions. It just doesn't seem nearly as definitive as you're making it out to I've be. Always, if you listen to me talk in the media or whatever, listen to stuff I write up, what I do is, in fact, even many of my op-eds, when I'm allowed to put in links, I put in a link to the list of studies. People can go and see the studies. They can see the ones that find a benefit. They can see the ones that claim that there's no effect. And so people can draw their own conclusions. But the point is, look, I, I don't know how much you're familiar with uh, academic debates on things. But if you look at almost anything, you know, minimum wage laws, anything, you're going to find people on both sides of an issue, a lot of people on both sides of the issue. This debate is extremely unusual in the sense that you take murder. How many published studies can you point to on concealed carry that find a bad effect on murder rates? Zero. There's not one. How many? So the entire debate in terms of murder is in, ter is in terms of of how much of a benefit there is. Maybe we could talk, I, I did want you to, to, to respond to, to this one point that Dr. John Donahue uh, took you precisely your same data, using your same methodology, extended it almost a decade in terms of, uh, in terms of new data, and he additionally corrected some of the some of key flaws that the National Research Council had. For example, uh, the panel failed to include you know, proper criminal justice controls, uh, they didn't have clustered standard errors, which is now common practice, as you know, among econometricians. When correcting these errors, which ha are, is accepted by the academic community as substantial errors, he found that uh, any of the ambiguity in the NRC's results vanish, and instead the clear evidence is that right-to-carry laws increase crime and aggravated assaults. Yeah, look... And, and I know the paper you're talking like about. Responses to that, given that this is clearly a study that you, you simply just don't mention. As well, uh, you haven't, you haven't read the debate on that paper after it was published. There's huge data errors in the Donahue paper. Nine thousand word column on the debate on that subject. So okay, well then, then you know the paper with Moody and others uh, that goes and shows, for example, they have one county that they have in seventy six times. Yeah. Right. Again, have, that movie get, paper in Table it, 3 shows the direct opposite of what you're claiming. No, for, for aggravated assaults, but the problem is when you take out the data errors, there's no reason why one county should be in there 76 times in their data set. Mm -hmm. They get many states off by a decade or more in terms of the laws, even from what they say in their own paper, coding errors. When you, you fix those types of coding errors, the result for aggravated assault goes away. Yeah, well, 
it's just, it's simply that's just simply not the case. What do you mean it's not the case? Go and contact Carl Moody or some other academics who are involved with that, Paul Zimmerman or others, and just see whether or not they have those types of mistakes in there, like a county being in there 76 times. Let me pause here because I do want to get to one other issue, which I know we, we wanted to talk about. And I believe that we may not necessarily get agreement if we continue focusing on this point. You have talked, uh, Mr. Lott, about how the vast majority of what you characterize as mass shootings occur in gun free zones. Tell us a little bit about that so we can talk about this a bit. Sure. Well, I mean, if you look at all the mass public shootings in the United States since at least 1950, with two exceptions, or all the ones in Europe, what you find is a consistent pattern is that is that these criminals keep on picking small areas where they are allowed to go and attack where victims can't defend themselves. So you see things like the Batman movie theater shooting, where you have seven movie theaters within a 20-minute drive of the killer's apartment there. Only one of those movie theaters posted a sign banning permanent concealed handguns. The killer didn't go to the movie theater that was closest to his home, didn't go to the one that had the largest auditoriums. He went to the only one that made it so that victims couldn't defend themselves. And you see this happen time after time. You know, I know, um, you, know uh, you have uh, Mother Jones, out there, which will go and claim that uh, there's uh, no mass shooting has been stopped by citizens with permit concealed handguns. The thing is, the fact that the citizens there stops it quickly. What Bill Landis at the University of Chicago and I have shown is that if you look at these mass public shootings, Bill and I looked at all the mass public shootings from 1977 through 1999 is that the one big factor that determines how many people get killed or injured at these attacks is the amount of time that elapses between when the attack starts and when someone is able to go and get there on the scene with the gun. But there's tons of errors in the, in the uh, Mother Jones study. You don't need to rely on me. There's D Dwayne Grant, who uh, is well known for his work on mass public shootings. He had put up something at Reason Magazine pointing to the number of early cases that Mother Jones missed. You have James Fox, who disagrees with me on almost everything else, except for the data errors in the Mother Jones things. James Fox is a liberal Democrat, strong proponent of gun control. Uh, he's at Northeastern University. He's someone who deals uh, extensively with this type of gun data, and yet he has pummeled uh, Mother Jones for not using consistent definitions, how they put in some things that are inconsistent with other cases that they exclude. OK, but let's pause. Let's pause on. I want to I want to pause the focus on Mother Jones, because really we want we want to talk uh, aside from well, what Evan Mother Jones says. Side. Let's hear what Evan has to say for a second. I, yeah, I, I mean, I'm not citing Mother Jones and I have no intention to. Um, the fact of the matter is that the majority of incidences where mass shootings occur they occur in places where people have been harmed, where there's a particular emotional grievance. Because a person just simply spends the majority of their time either in school or work, the majority of shootings happen at school or work, which happens to be gun-free zones. I mean, they're not, they're not selecting these places in order to maximize death count. Uh, they are selecting these places because it is an area for which they, you know, they were emotionally attacked or they felt that they were abused and they're responding to that. If shooters are so pathologically preoccupied with maximizing deaths, they should be flying over to Australia where there's a gun ban and shooting there. But the fact of the matter is, is that these people are choosing the places not because of any kind of strategic hyper-rational calculation, which is, which, which is simply naive, but because... Uh, there's an emotional attachment to these locations, that, and it just happens to be the case that these places are also gun-free zones. And I, and I wanted to challenge this idea. Lots of businesses uh, are not gun-free zones. I get, I get having these five things. minutes to talk, so if you could lend me the same courtesy. Um, I'm just trying to make it more efficient by just letting you respond to what the point will be. Great. Um, so when John says uh, he, he, he makes this contention that you know there's almost no... Uh, attacks. Uh, almost every single attack has occurred in a gun-free zone. Let's sort of unpackage that and see what he means by this. First, to be clear, there was an every town study on this subject. Uh, they found that there have been at least 16 mass shootings that have occurred uh, entirely in places where guns are not banned. Second, just to give some examples of how John Lott operationalizes 
this phrase gun ban. Let's take the case of, um, I believe it was Hialeah, Florida. Um, in 2010, there was a mass shooting there where four more people were killed. This was a small restaurant. Uh, you can see in, in images from Yelp reviews, for example, that the restaurant has a bar area and then there's a main portion where meals are served. Dr. Lott claims that this place is a gun-free zone because permit holders aren't allowed in restaurants whose primary business um, is serving alcohol. However, in cases where restaurants have bars, Florida law suggests that permit holders should avoid the bar area, but they can carry everywhere else in the restaurant. But John just in asserts that this place is a gun-free zone because of the Florida restriction on on having guns in bars and this this sort of he makes this sort of argument in multiple instances where there's not any clear evidence that it's a gun free zone and he just asserts that that's the case I so, called up the restaurant immediately after the attack I talked to them I asked them what the rules were for their particular restaurant there they serve alcohol beverages all over the place in there there's not a clear delineation as I recall but you can go look at my website because I have a discussion on there when I called them up at the time and uh, you know but uh, these studies uh, Bloomberg's groups don't call up these places they don't find out whether what the policy was at that place they don't find out whether the bar was actually separate from the rest of the restaurant for example mm. John I would be interested in hearing you respond to what I think is the most the most pertinent uh, uh, t thing raised here by Evan which is even if you can show a correlation we have you de have you demonstrated that there's a causal relationship between shooters choosing gun free zones because they are such well look um you can look over time all right and what you find is that the states that are right to carry and many of them 98 99 percent of the state you're able to go and carry your permanent concealed handgun these attacks to the extent that they still occur occur in tiny areas within the state if these were random then it should be 98 99 percent of the time you should see these mass public shootings you know uh he evan mentions um uh businesses well you know where these attacks occur you have businesses that are gun-free zones and you have businesses that allow people to carry why is it that you don't see attacks occurring in these places where they allow people to carry in those types of businesses? Is it just random that that happens all the time? And it's and and you saw the work that I did with Bill Landis uh, when we looked at these mass public shootings over a couple decades. We found that when states pass permit concealed carry laws, you saw about a forty percent drop in mass public shootings immediately after the laws got passed and that to the extent to which the attacks occurred they occurred in these tiny areas they started changing where they occurred and started occurring only within these tiny areas within the state where permanent concealed handguns weren't allowed before they were occurring in all sorts of other businesses okay now so let, let, let's let Evan respond to that because we are running shorter on time and I want to make sure that ha, has he addressed Evan has John addressed the issue of correlation versus causation in your mind no no not not in my mind there I mean this this question has been in, investigated previously uh, the fact of the matter is is when you examine the motivation behind the attackers you can either look at letters they've left behind uh, arguments that they've had you know with friends when you examine the motivation behind their arguments they are saying that they're not motivated by media glory you know they're not motivated Seriously? in an effort to maximize kill count it's just such a vapid notion that criminals are these hyper rational agents that can undergo this process of Bayesian updating where they have a sense of the number of concealed carry owners in a particular region and they alter strategically alter their location based upon national numbers like this this just doesn't work maybe this is how like economists think about the issue but it's not how criminologists think about the issue and it's not how it plays out in reality the fact of the matter is is that it is a snap event that occurs due to some psychological trauma and they target people that they know in an area and this is the consistent case um, consistent case throughout the mass shootings that we're looking at and and if motivation matters so much we should examine this recent FBI report on active shooter incidents since 2000 this is situations in which the shooters in public trying to inflict casualties um, the, the evidence doesn't get any better for uh, in, in terms of examining this issue. 
Of the 160 incidences the FBI catalogs, only one was stopped with an armed citizen with a gun. Five were stopped by security guards, and 20 more were stopped by unarmed civilians, which just shows how effective good guys with guns are. And Lod is going to say, well, of course they weren't stopped by armed citizens, because the fact of the matter is all of these concealed carry people deterred the shooting from ever happened. But there's no evidence that this is how motivation works. There's no evidence that criminals... Uh, can actually internalize the fact that there is a, a dense area of... Uh, well, you, you just have to look at this year. change their risk perception based upon that fact. He's just... Time, assertion. time after time, you see evidence left by these killers that they're taking this into account. I'll just give you two examples from this year. Look at the Santa Barbara killer. If you read his manifesto, he explicitly talked about why he picked the venue he did to do the attack based on whether there would be guns there to stop him. You look at the Canadian Moncton shooter that was there. Right. He, on his Facebook page, he had like six comics posted about gun-free zones, making fun of the fact that victims were saying you can't have a gun here before the guy, the killer, ends up killing them. And you see this time after time. But look, the evidence with regard to concealed carry and uh, crime rates generally it's much easier in a broader sense there to go and deal with the causality issue because you have so many different types of tests. And I try to go through these at the beginning. You see the percentage of the population with permits, how it changes over time. The ones that have the most permit have the biggest drops. You see differences across different types of crime rates. You see geographic differences. There's several other differences that I could mention. People can go and look them up on crimeresearch.org or in my book. But the point is... You have so many different types of qualitative evidence. It's very hard, and I'm explicit about this in More Guns, Less Crime, it's very hard to come up with an alternative explanation that can explain all these different results. None of the studies, even the ones that uh, Evan was talking about that find no effect on look at just one type of evidence. They don't look at all these other types of evidence. Why do you think that's the case? All right. And Evan, I will let you answer that question and we'll give you the last word. John Lott had the first word here and I will let you address that question as we wrap up. Uh, sure. The The fact of the matter is, is that um, and, and I mentioned this before, that Lott is the one that's making the claim, the extraordinary claim that more guns produce less crime. And throughout the dis throughout this discussion, he's hedging his bets. He's, He's not no longer making offensive arguments as to how more guns lead to less crime, but as to how uh, you know the the conclusion from uh, the National Research Council was that uh, there there is no conclusion. That's that's a, that's different than the original argument that he was making, which requires extraordinary evidence. The fact of the matter is is that econometrics, uh, especially of the level of sophistication and complexity that uh, Dr. Lott participates in, it requires a tremendous amount of trust. Uh, it, it requires not only because it's largely inaccessible to the public, but also because there's just a lot of uncertainty about what goes on uh, in econometric models. And the fact of the matter is, it's just that Lot is not deserving of of the trust of the audience. It's uh, he, I mean, he has a storied history of academic dishonesty, where he's fabricated large surveys. He invented a sock puppet to worship at his own. Davis. He regularly invents fake statistics to further his cause. And, and we demonstrated in this discussion that he cherry-picks data to support, uh, to support his claim. So, I mean, the fact of the matter is, is that it's not nearly as clear-cut. Um, I report the entire studies that people can look at. I use all the data, and, and I go through my surveys. I list out the data, uh, the different studies. Other people have done surveys, too, okay? If you want to go and point to another published academic survey, fine. I'd be interested in hearing about it. But the thing is... No matter how you cut this, the vast majority of academics find a benefit. The debate is, unlike almost all other academic debates, the debate is over how large the benefit is. You have maybe 30% who claims that there's no effect, and the other 70% that claim that there's a benefit. Maybe 62% if you want to include non-national studies that pick uh, some small area to go and look at. But you know, if you want to get into these personal attacks, which you know are inaccurate, uh, then we, we should go and have a show on those. But uh, I don't really see the point of doing that. Look, because you don't need to rely on me. There's lots of other academics that one can look at. And you can go to crimeresearch.org. You can go to other places to go and look at an entire list and not a cherry-picked list of, uh, of studies that are there.
Right. Um, yeah, I mean, it's clear that we're going to be on an impasse in this subject. If, uh, if anyone is interested, we have a list of studies that were strategically excluded from the cherry-picked sample on armedwithreason.com, and I guess we could just let audience members decide. Uh, My this, book, this More Guns, Less Crime, goes through all those studies that you mentioned. I, okay. All right, we so are going to is, we are we are going to have to, go to leave and say it there. That I ignore those studies or cher cherry picking would be that I ignored them, that I didn't talk about them, right? So sure. if I go through and actually go and talk about the studies, how is that cherry picking? It, well, first there is there's at least seven studies not included in the list, uh, which I can I can simply rattle off. And second, of the ones that you do study, you the ones that you do examine, you either misinterpret. Or don't give equal weight to you give equal weight to all claims when not all studies are created equal. All right, we are going to have to pause there. I want to remind the audience we've been speaking with John Lott, president of the Crime Prevention Research Center, and Evan DePhilippis, co-founder of Armed with Reason. There is of course more to talk about. Both of you are welcome to be back on the program anytime. I think it will be a very interesting conversation for our audience, and I can't thank you both enough for being on today. Yeah, thanks so much for having me on the show. Thanks. Appreciate it. Thanks very much. Happy New Year.